Um, uh, I, I guess I should do the what is pataphysics um, uh, thing first of all, uh, just in case there's anybody in the room who uh, does, I, usually at this point I say, uh, does, it, does everybody know what pataphysics is? And of course a few people look blank and then they feel terrible because everybody else knows. So I'm not going to do that, I'm just going to give you the what is pataphysics. Um, so the word was um, uh, first used it by schoolboys in Rennes in France in the 1880s. And it was a way of um, taking the uh, mickey out of their um, science teacher, who was a, a rather ineffectual man called Hébert. Um, H-E-B-E-R-T and um, they, uh, they used to delight in asking this chap questions that he couldn't answer um, and uh, which was uh, as it turned out were well, most questions actually um, and, uh, and rather than admit he didn't know he would make up answers um, uh, that seemed scientific um, and so he became this uh, uh, they called this pataphysics it's, it's his kind of imaginary science um, so that's where it all started. And one, one of the um, schoolboys in question was a, uh, a writer called Alfred Jarry, uh, J-A-R-R-Y, um, who uh, proceeded to um, develop this character of Hébert, who became known at the school as Abe, E-B-E. -E. Um, and they used to make marionette plays featuring this puppet, puppet version of this science teacher. Um, and Jerry worked him into a, a figure called Ubu, U-B-U, -U, who perhaps people will have heard of, um, and staged a play called uh, Ubu Wa, King Ubu, in 1896 in Paris. And it caused a, uh, caused a riot, basically. And the reason it caused a riot was partly because of the uh, approach to theatrical setting, which was completely anti-naturalistic. So at the time in, in Parisian theatre, you know, if you had an army, you had a bunch of people in uniforms carrying spears walking across the stage. In Jarry's version, you just have a man with a placard saying, I am the army. Um, <laughs> and, it, and, it, it, and also the set design had all the seasons represented at the same time. Uh, and, uh, and then the figure of Ubu himself is this enormous, uh, enormously bloated individual with a great big spiral drawn on his belly who carries a loo brush and at the, at the beginning of the play, steps to the front of the stage, and the first word he says is merdre. Uh, and merde in French uh, means shit, which, uh, of course, is a word that was uh, never spoken on the French stage at that time. In fact, the only, um, the only recorded instance when it was uh, considered acceptable in polite society in France to use the word merde was uh, General Combron at the Battle of Waterloo, surrounded by the English, uh, realised that he was inevitably going to die and said to his lieutenant, Merde. <laughs> and this, this was considered the only acceptable use of the word. Uh, and of course, Jarry did something, which is to add a letter R to this word, so Merdre, which of course doesn't really mean anything, but gives it that kind of emphasis, that extra venom. And um, Ubu kind of represents everything that's grotesque and distorted and... Uh, wrong with uh, the world. He, he, uh, he seizes the throne. The plot of this play is a bit like Macbeth, uh, combined with Hamlet, combined with a few other um, uh, pieces of writing. It sort of assimilates loads of literature. And he, so he, he takes the throne, seizes the throne, uh, treats everybody appallingly, massacres um, all the judges and the lawyers and the uh, people of learning, puts them down the hatch. Uh, and then, and then uh, uh, when uh, the Bougrelas, uh, which is also a rather obscene name, uh, but Bougrelas, who's uh, the son of the king, uh, comes back and defeats Ubu in battle, um, which turns out to be pretty easy because Ubu's a totally useless general and a coward to boot. Uh, and then the end of the plague, Ubu and his wife, Ma Ubu, um, disappear and go on holiday. And that's it. <laughs> And U Ubu says uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, says in, this, uh, in, in the play, I'll soon have made my fortune, then we'll kill everybody and go away. And that's pretty much what happens. Um, so Ubu is, the, is a, uh, a professor of pataphysics. Um, and Jarry then went on to develop this, this cod science into something rather more um, philosophical. So he wrote a series of novels. Um, there's one called Days and Nights, um, which is a subtitled novel of a, of a deserter, uh, in which 
the, the incidents of the daytime are described as though they're happening at night and vice versa. Uh, except that then that breaks down as well and you end up in this rather blurry um, area where the head leaves the body. Um, uh, in, in Ubu, uh, there's a debraining machine and heads are cut off. In days and nights, the head leaves the body and sort of flies above the clouds. Um, uh, so it's still attached, but it sort of floats. Um, and then uh, probably the most important book uh, is Dr. Faustrol, um, which is, is there. Uh, Dr. Faustrol, uh, the full title is The Exploits and Opinions of Dr. Faustrol, Pataphysician. And in this book, Jarry sets out um, the elements of pataphysics. Uh, which he defines in various ways. Um, and uh, at this point, I should say that actually uh, pataphysics is pretty much impossible to define. Um, in fact, uh, to define pataphysics is to make a fundamental mistake. Uh, but I'm going to do it anyway, and I'll use Jarry's own definition, so I'm uh, least likely to go wrong. But I say in my book, uh, to, to understand pataphysics is to fail to understand pataphysics. So um, in Faustrol, there's a character of Dr. Faustrol who's born at the age of 63. Um, he wears wallpaper and has multicolored uh, moustaches. And he travels from Paris to Paris by sea in a sieve. Uh, and the sieve is rowed by his, a bailiff called Pont Moufle, which means all snout, who turns up at the beginning of the novel uh, to serve notice on uh, Faustrol to quit his apartment, uh, but ends up being chained to the bottom of this skiff and uh, has to row... Uh, Faustrol and his companion around uh, the islands of Paris. And um, the companion is a dog-faced baboon called po a Bostonage <coughs> who um, only ever says ha-ha. So uh, Dr. Faustrol delivers a, le a lengthy disqu disquisition on the subject of pataphysics and uh, uh, afterwards uh, Bostonage will always comment ha-ha. And uh, Faustrol defines pataphysics in various ways and uh, he calls it the uh, science of the laws governing exceptions and the science of the laws of the particular. Uh, and he says that pataphysics is to metaphysics as metaphysics is to physics. Uh, I'll say that again, <laughs> just to give you a moment to think about it. Pataphysics is to metaphysics as metaphysics is to physics. Um, and he uh, summarises it as pataphysics is the science of imaginary solutions. In fact, the definition is a bit longer than that, but I'll stick with just that short one uh, for the time being. So hopefully from that very brief canter through um, the sort of essentials, you get the idea of what, what we're talking about. It's, it's fundamentally a, lit a literary concept with philosophical overtones, but it gets applied in all sorts of areas. And um, this, since Jarry, um, this concept has really continued to evolve and uh, to take, capture people's imaginations. Uh, most notice, notably, I guess, in the formation of the uh, College de Pataphysique in Paris in 1947. So in the immediate post-war years, um, a group of intellectuals got together and formed what was essentially an absurd um, academic institution that has no physical uh, location, um, but can, carries on research into pataphysics. And that has continued to the present day. Uh, I guess the most famous um, instance of the word uh, in our culture has been the Beatles' use of it in one of their songs. Um, Maxwell's Silver Hammer, people may remember. The line goes, Joan was quizzical, studied pataphysical science in the home. Um, Paul McCartney was a great admirer of Ubu and um, uh, thought that pataphysical um, sounded like a great word. And in fact, the Beatles then joined the college to pataphysique alongside many other famous individuals, such as Marcel Duchamp, Raymond Cano, the Marx Brothers, e Eugene Ionesco. Um, oh, well, I could go on. The list is, is very lengthy, but there's some very, very well-known people. Um, and the thing is still very much alive today, so people are still talking about it and writing about it. In fact, here I am talking about it. So uh, I'll just go back to the previous slide, actually. So, physical uh, route through these slides. Uh, Hongji uh, earlier said to me, why is your talk called the pataphysics of the future and not the future of pataphysics? Which is quite an interesting question. And I think the answer is that I don't really much uh, worry about the future of pataphysics um, because pataphysics exists 
whether or not um, it is understood to exist. Um, the pataphysics of the future, on the other hand, is a different matter. And this, as Martin said, is using pataphysical methods or pataphysical approaches to um, try and uh, make predictions and understand the future. Uh, and then also uh, the apostrophe. Somebody mentioned, where's the apostrophe? Well, uh, normally um, you uh, see a, an apostrophe before the word uh, pataphysics. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, it was in, in Faustrol, where it defines pataphysics, uh, at one point, Jarry says, uh, the word is preceded by an apostrophe so as to avoid a simple pun. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't tell us what the simple pun might be. So we don't really know what this means or what the apostrophe represents. However, uh, that is the only occasion on which Jarry ever used the apostrophe. And um, there's been enormous debate about this, about whether you should use it or not. And the College de Pataphysique finally ruled that um, uh, you should use the apostrophe only when referring specifically to Jarry's pataphysics in a conscious way that is understood by everybody. Other than that, you should not use the apostrophe, and if in doubt, uh, don't use it. Um, Jarry himself mostly didn't use it, so it's only on a single occasion that he used it. So I've, I've followed college rules here. Okay, so um, Faustrol says, why should anyone claim that the shape of a watch is round, perhaps under the pretext of utility? Uh, so one of the sort of founding principles of pataphysics is that uh, general science is founded on a, on a mistaken principle, which is the idea of the repeatable experiment. Um, so you can uh, add water to salt, and the salt will dissolve. And if you do that again and again, the salt will always dissolve, right? That's science. In pataphysics, that isn't the case. In pataphysics, each time you add water to salt, that is a unique event, and it's exceptional in its particular way. And so, uh, according to Jarry, the, the law of exceptions governs everything, and therefore um, one cannot see any general principle derived from uh, repetition. When we come to questions of utility, um, uh, this, uh, this is a good example. Uh, this kind of flows on from what I just said. You, when you ask someone what shape is a watch, they'll invariably say it's round. Um, and why? Because when you look at your watch, uh, you look at the face of the watch to tell what the time is, right? That's the pretext of utility. But Jarry, he goes on to say, but if you look at it from its side, it's a sort of ellipse. Um, and uh, it doesn't have that, utility, that function of utility. And th this is a, a kind of a theme in pataphysics, is this idea of uselessness. And the, the, my book has a subtitle, A Useless Guide, and I, I really mean that, actually. Uh, people laugh at it when they see the title. Um, I mean, whether or not it's, it's bad is another matter, but it certainly is useless in the sense that pataphysics, uh, having a guide to pataphysics is a contradiction in terms, which, of course, in itself is highly pataphysical. So this leads on to my first um, prediction, which is uselessness will increase and be seen as a positive antidote to an era of utility. Um, so th this is my prediction for the future. Uh, this is something that I've observed uh, in the IOCT and in general, is that increasingly we live in an er era of utility. Um, so we are constantly try try trying to make things that are useful or to take things that already exist and make them somehow useful, or generally to be useful, right? Even the definition of creativity that you see says it's creating novel things that are useful. That seems to be one of the main drivers for creativity, that is that it has to be useful. And I think human nature um, uh, uh, is quite pataphysical and resists this drive to use utility. Now, we all make useful things. I mean, I make useful things. We all like useful things. Uh, we're using loads of them right now, computers, clocks, etc. But uh, there's something in the human spirit, it seems to me, that resists utility as a driver and wants to create more uselessness. And so the harder things uh, uh, people try to make utility, um, the stronger the resistance. And that's the, where the... Uh, prediction comes from. So my sort of underlying assumption here is that society is becoming more utilitarian, not less, and that therefore uselessness will increase. Um, I'll give you an example. Okay. 
So th these are two um, uh, pathophysical solutions to the business of cleaning the house. Um, and as you'll see, they're both quite useless. Uh, Jacques Caraman uh, produced two catalogues of unfindable objects, literally, um, in, uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, and here you have a pair of slippers uh, with a, um, a, a brush and a, a what do you call it? Dustpan, dust thank you. Uh, a dustpan attached. So you, you can wear your slippers and walk around the house and dust at the same time. And this, Shindogu, uh, Martin will tell you all about this, is a Japanese um, version of the same idea. So here it's not a human being just cleaning, but a cat. So the cat has little dusters attached to its feet. And as the cat wanders around the apartment in the way that it does, it dusts the floor. So these, these are um, solutions to problems that don't really exist. Um, they're, they're useless. I mean, we would never actually make these. But judging by the facial expressions in the room, um, they do have a certain... Um, I need one. I need you, we need one. You know, somehow, in some, in some parallel universe, we quite like to have them, right? Them in magazines and Sunday newspapers. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, in fact, those catalogues that uh, that are full of useful gadgets. You know that if you bought them all, you feel your life would be measurably improved. But then at the same time, you realise you could never use them all, and your, your your life would actually become just nothing but a matter of servicing these these devices all the time, and a, kind of an essay in, in uselessness in a way. And, you know, attaching dusters to a cat's paws must be quite a, a, a lengthy and difficult process. <laughs> and as for wearing these, I mean, how would you, you know? But the, these are imaginary solutions, okay? There's quite a lot of fun in pathophysics. Uh, oh, I've already talked about this. This is the book. Um, so, I, I mean, I suppose I should say as well that uh, pathophysics is overwhelmingly subjective. Um, almost by definition. So, you know, we're not talking about uh, some kind of objective law here. We're talking about a, sub, uh, a kind of intense subjectivity. And this is why I'm interested in it. I think it has some relevance to transdisciplinary working, which is why we're all here, in that um, one of the biggest issues, it seems to me, in transdisciplinary working is to reconcile um, the uh, subjective ambiguities with objective precision. So our systems are becoming ever more precise. The computer is getting better and better at being precise. Uh, software engineering is precise. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so we have this, this uh, mathematically derived precision underpinning all our technology. At the same time, we as humans, of course, are um, uh, quite messy, ambiguous creatures, very subjective on the whole, um, in, almost inevitably. We try to be objective but we don't always succeed, particularly if you work in the arts, there's a lot of subjectivity. So how do you reconcile those two as the two great disciplines collide? What is the relationship between them? Uh, and one sees all sorts of um, contradictions uh, developing, um, which are that's often quite pathophysical, particularly around language, actually. Um, the use of terminologies between computer scientists and people working in the arts and humanities is very interesting area, I think. So, uh, for example, if we take uh, in a database, there's this word entity that computer scientists talk about quite a lot. Um, and computer scientists know exactly what an entity is. They can draw one and they can tell you how it functions. Uh, in the arts and humanities, we also have a concept of entity. Um, a ghost is an entity. It's rather indistinct and blurry, but there is something there. That's a, we, so we think we know what entity means. Computer scientists know what entity means. When the two collaborate, um, what does entity mean in that context? And generally what happens is, or what I observe, is a, a kind of a, a battle, of, a semantic battle that goes on, whether real or unacknowledged, eventually settling usually in favour of the computer science version because we want to get things done. We want to be useful. So we want to make things happen, so we, we resolve to accept uh, the, data, the SQL version of entity uh, for the sake of argument in order to achieve what we want to achieve. Not always, but often. <clears throat> so the prediction, I've got three predictions, by the way, before I shut up. 
So, um, second prediction. Well, first of all, uh, there's this message from Sandomir. Sandomir was the first head of the College of Pataphysics. Um, when he died, uh, there was uh, an article which suggested that he'd never existed. Um, and the, the college was immensely um, annoyed by this and sent uh, car postcards from every corner of the globe to the man who'd suggested that he never existed, telling him that he didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so this was when uh, the, uh, in Buenos Aires, they set up a, a, a kind of another version of the College of Pataphysics. It was the first um, overseas, out, i.e. outside France version of the college. And Sandomir sent this message. Is there any need to wish pataphysics well in Buenos Aires? It was there as it was everywhere before we came into existence, and it can do without a lot of us. It will always exist and will do without us all together. It can even do without existing, for it does not need to exist in order to exist. Uh, this is why I don't really care about the future of pataphysics, because um, uh, uh, I think that's probably true. So my second prediction Pataphysics will become ever more conscious as physics replaces metaphysics. So, you know, one thing that's changed since Jarry's day is the position of physics in relation to metaphysics. I think we can observe this uh, quite uh, well, even just with a kind of uh, amateur's view of physics, which is uh, pretty much my position. Um, you know, you read a bit, you watch the telly, you pick things up, um, you understand physics as far as you can. And what we see is that physics increasingly uh, encroaching onto what was traditionally metaphysics. Um, so, you know, theories of everything, dark matter, quantum mechanics. You know, these are ideas that are quite pataphysical. They're imaginary solutions. Dark matter was theorized by Lord Kelvin. Uh, he called it the, tr the luminiferous ether. Uh, and Jarry wrote a, a, a pastiche of this idea. Um, so the idea of, uh, of a matter that you can't see, that has no material existence, uh, and yet is uh, the, the main component of the universe, um, seems to uh, start to get into metaphysical territory. And one gets the impression that the physicists um, believe they have the answer to everything. I mean, I don't know if you've been watching uh, Brian Cox's series on the wonders of life recently, but you know, you've got a physicist now um, talking about biology. I mean, it probably has more to do with um, him being the next David Attenborough than, um, than anything else, but he, he brings a particular kind of angle to biology that is quite different to anything Attenborough would have said. Uh, and again, it's physics sort of extending into the, what would, would have been the metaphysical area. Now, I, because physics is so material, um, I think one will then have a reaction against this. And this tends to drive towards pataphysics um, because... The absurdity of Brian Cox is uh, all too evident as well, and um, uh, and so you know you start to you start to uh, uh, use uh, more and more uh, bizarre and humorous ways of undercutting um, what physics is saying, and in fact um, we're seeing that uh, online and also to some extent in science fiction, which I think is where a lot of this resides. Um, so I see that as a pataphysical tendency, and I see metaphysics as being squeezed out somewhat by, um, by the two. So that's my second prediction. <coughs> and then, um, I, I, I don't know if people are familiar with this um, Borges text, but this is a, a Chinese encyclopedia that he imagines, um, and in it is a definition of animals. And I'll read a few of them and you can read the rest because I don't really like reading out slides. But anyway, he defines them in this way. Those that belong to the emperor, embalmed ones, those that are trained, suckling pigs, mermaids, fabulous ones, stray dogs, those included in the present classification, those that tremble as if they were mad, innumerable ones, those drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, others... <laughs> those that have just broken a flower vase, those that from a long way off look like flies. Um, and again, this is, this is, sorry, I did read it all in the end. Once you get going, there's a certain poetic rhythm to it, isn't there? And you can see that uh, as, a, as a taxonomy of animals, this is completely useless. I mean, you, you, you wouldn't define animals this way. On the other hand, it has a certain uh, underlying poetic unity, a certain logic to it. 
Uh, and in an imaginary sense, you can imagine a, an encyclopedia that does define things this way. Um, so uh, my third prediction is that, um, following on from that, is that logical taxonomies will increasingly be replaced by imaginary solutions. Faced with, uh, with a vast welter of uh, data and taxonomic uh, ways of organizing that data and uh, understanding it or tagging it, we will find ourselves increasingly turning to imaginary solutions rather than logical solutions because the logic starts to break down in the face of um, uh, that kind of writing. Uh, and this leads us on to the software that we're going to look at. But um, just before I do, I, I should also just mention three ideas that are crucial to pataphysics that, um, that I think are going to be significant as well. So these are sort of sub-predictions, if you like, that relate to this. Uh, the first is the idea of syzygy, um, which is spelled S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. And syzygy is uh, uh, like an alignment. Um, so an eclipse is an example of a syzygy. Um, it's when things unexpectedly perhaps come into alignment. And in, in Jarry, he calls it the syzygy of words, and it's about language and the way uh, you can play with language. If, uh, so a pun is a syzygy of words. It's when meanings come into alignment and suddenly you see things differently. Uh, the second idea, which is rather a, an ancient idea, is clinamen. Uh, that's C-L-I-N-A-M-E-N, clinamen. And this was uh, first suggested by Epicurus. And uh, Epicurus' um, theory was the universe is made of atoms in a state of continuous uh, descent from an absolute high to an absolute low. That's to say there's no beginning and no end. They just continuously descend. And they're all following a parallel path. However, um, every so often, for reasons that we cannot understand, one of these atoms makes a slight swerve or deviation in its um, path and collides with a neighboring atom, which sets up a chain reaction. And the chain reactions are matter. So we're all the result of this accidental swerve or bias. Now, bear in mind that Epicurus was writing with no experimental evidence whatsoever. This was just a, a piece, an imaginary solution, if you like. Uh, but it's surprising how close it sounds to uh, modern theories of atomic uh, behavior. But uh, that's a clinament. And in pataphysical terms, that swerve or deviation is very important. And I, I think it's particularly interesting in relation to creativity. Um, so the idea that you have to not follow a line directly to what you believe to be the outcome, but you swerve or deviate to find some kind of divergent uh, path through the idea or some kind of divergence in terms of thinking. Um, and I think anybody who's, who's you know, done anything creative will recognize this. You, know, you can start out one way, but you always end up going somewhere else. And that's the clinum, I think. And then the third idea, which is um, quite uh, familiar, I would guess, is anomaly. Um, anomaly, rather like exceptions in pataphysics, is the thing that doesn't fit, the anomalous entity. And uh, that in itself has a way of throwing the cat among the pigeons, as it were, and causing all sorts of um, chaos and displacement and uh, humour and whatever it may be. So these are three kind of crucial ideas, and we've worked with these on this project. This is Jim. Uh, Jim was visiting professor here until uh, what, a couple of years ago now um, in the IOCT. He's the, uh, the lead scientist on the semantic web, which is the, um, the next generation of the web, basically. He worked with Tim Berners-Lee and wrote the original paper on the, on the semantic web that um, uh, envisages the harnessing of the collective intelligence of the web. So um, essentially, it's, a, it's kind of an AI project using uh, all the machines, all the processing power that's attached to the web to um, uh, lead to something that understands um, human interaction. So uh, in, 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 the, in the classic paper, they use an example, I think, of uh, choosing wine in a restaurant. And uh, so you can get a very good um, uh, choice of wine based not on um, your own preference, but based on some kind of intelligence that is gathered from, uh, from the semantic web. And we're familiar with now, I think, with things like uh, uh, markups that, you, that use semantic web as a way of tagging data in order to provide ever more sophisticated and responsive results. 
And the way this is usually trumpeted is as um, something that will understand your interaction to the point where it knows what you mean when you type something, even if the thing is spelt the same. So if you type a word and it, it's one wo spelt one way, but it has two different meanings, it will know which of the two meanings you're after because it's understanding you. Uh, it has your history and it understands you. And of course, um, uh, this is from a utility point of view and from a commercial point of view is a great uh, prize. And we're already sort of there in some respects with Amazon, you know, other people who bought this also bought, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, But uh, the, the vision of the semantic web takes us a bit further. Uh, it also has lots of applications in, um, in digital humanities, in museum studies, and these kinds of areas where you've got you know, rich information, very large collections, and you can use the semantic web to, um, uh, to navigate those effectively. Um, so Jim has a very, uh, a very uh, how shall I say, uh, polemical uh, presentation that he does, uh, where he uh, criticizes what he calls the forces of neatness. And the forces of neatness are basically the, the committee that is deciding how the semantic web is going to be configured, how it's going to be organized. And, uh, and he uses the analogy also with Lord of the Rings. He says, well, all you need is one hobbit in there with a different agenda, and it can upset the whole apple cart. And th this caused a lot of, a lot of uh, argument amongst computer scientists about the forces of neatness and um, their likely effect on the semantic web. And obviously, you'll, you, it won't take much to realize that I, being a pathophysician, I quite like uh, something that isn't that neat. Um, so Jim got interested in this idea, and he asked me to write the book, basically, and that's the rest is history, as they say. So we came up with this um, notion of uh, a new kind of search engine. Now, I'm going to hand over to Hongji and uh, Fanya in a moment to talk about the the computer science, and this is, this is a slide from our paper that we've recently done. So what, what, what we're looking to do is to create a, uh, what we're calling a Syzygy surfer. You remember how in the early days of the web, you could surf the web? Now, this doesn't really work anymore, but I, I remember how it was back in 1993, when, or four, or whenever it was, when the web first started. And there was basically almost nothing there. So you could wander around the web confronting unexpected uh, things all the time. You know, you couldn't really predict your path. And it was great fun. I mean, you, you just really encountered loads of stuff that you, you really didn't um, uh, know was there. Well, of course, nowadays, you can't really do this. I mean, if you put something into Google, the first thing you get is Wikipedia. Then you get a commercial, uh, commercial find. And then you get about a million pages of stuff that seems to be the, exactly the same thing. And maybe on the million and first, first uh, hit, you get something that's really coming from left of field. It's quite hard to surf. The word surfing was uh, used to describe an activity that was both fun and required a degree of skill. You know? um, and I think you know, there's less and less skill in surfing the web and uh, less and less fun as well uh, these days. I mean, on the plus side, of course, you do get to what you want, <laughs> which is often, uh, often really good. You know? But uh, I'm not interested so much in that because well, everybody's working on that. What I'm interested in is in, is in the stuff you don't know you want and, uh, until you find it. You know? um, how do you get to the thing that is a surprise? You know? So that's what we've been trying to do. So we're building a, a search engine that delivers you um, these kinds of surprises. Um, and we're using these three ideas of Klinemen, Syzygy, and Anomaly uh, to do it. And perhaps uh, I could ask Hongji and Fanya to talk about the, the technology. In my mind, or in my early mind, uh, computing is about uh, physics and uh, um, mathematics. It's half computing and half, uh, uh, sorry, half mathematics, half uh, physics. Uh, everything should follow the rules of either mathematics or physics. Hence, um, um, but in, in reality, um, it is not the case. Uh, I'm uh, was like a, a person locking the house and wanting to go out. Um, because um, in computing, everything has to be done by rules. If I don't find rules, computing uh, does not work. Um, but to solve a um, practical problem, or a problem in the real world, I, I don't always find uh, rules. Hence, I'm, I'm struggling. Uh, suddenly, uh, 
I, I, I came across the world of, of physics and uh, started uh, uh, questioning whether that's suitable or why. Uh, in, in Chinese, uh, uh, the word was translated into, in fact, it's like uh, nonsense. Uh, in English, English was nonsense. At first, I thought that perhaps uh, there wasn't a, a connection between pedophysics and the computing. Uh, uh, well, I was become, uh, uh, well, I was studying very more, talking to uh, Andrew very more, then I became, became uh, a sort of a hooked to uh, kind of physics in, in, in such a way, uh, because um, um, a surprise uh, way of uh, uh, doing something um, possible from something being impossible. Uh, it's like, uh, uh, in my mind or somewhere, I, I just feel perhaps that it's a way uh, going forward uh, that I can find the rules, I can do things with, with, the, with the computing. Uh, that, that's the, the, uh, what I'm, I'm feeling. Also, I feel that it is a way of being creative. Uh, get, uh, I'm so used to uh, physical and uh, mathematical rules, and then I suddenly uh, asking to forget all these rules is difficult. However, I got to find the reason from the excuse to say I don't have to observe the, those rules. Hence, uh, uh, kind of physics is a way of doing it. Uh, I've been doing it uh, for some time. I'm working with uh, Andrew and Fanny and, and Jim uh, on this uh, kind of physics search engine. This is uh, the first example of uh, linking computing with uh, uh, kind of physics. Um, Perhaps the main thing is to say uh, how to find the, the usefulness from the uselessness, and even uh, uh, how we could interpret the uh, search result um, um, to, uh, obtained by this of uh, uh, physics search engine. That's what we're working at this minute. I should say uh, just one one sort of rider to that is uh, you say we're, it's the first we're, this is the first uh, instance of pathophysics and computing, but of course that that's true in software engineering terms. But in terms of um, uh, combining the use of uh, computer science and pathophysics, it, we are we aren't the first. Um, the Spec Lab in University of Virginia um, with jo Johanna Drucker and uh, and others, uh, Bethany Nowitzki as well have been using uh, pathophysics for um, their uh, digital humanities work for some time. So. I, I, I did not expect, um, state that to clear that, but it is uh, my, my first attempt of... Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's, uh, it, it's P creativity rather than H creativity, as they say. Uh, P, P creativity is, this is Margaret Bowden, P creativity is uh, uh, personal... Uh, creativity, basically, uh, stuff that is new for you, but isn't necessarily new for the whole world. And H creativity is historical creativity, which is new for everybody. Uh, she says, you know, if, if Einstein's theory of relativity had been invented by somebody else before Einstein, uh, if we discovered that, would it mean that Einstein's uh, theory wasn't a creative uh, thing? Well, of course, it wouldn't. Um, sure, that's my key creativity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I have some slides here that you've seen, so you help, yeah, yeah. feel free to use them. I suppose the only thing I can say now, I'm going to show you a prototype um, when the manual finishes the slides, is that really what we did is we, we tried to use some of these specific themes of quantum physics, i.e. and Kinnaman, syzygy and, and antinomy and anomaly and these kind of things, um, as, and, and kind of used them as algorithms to drive our search engine. Um, and it, uh, I can show you the results that these kind of different algorithms produce. Um, so okay, can, uh, let's let's go on to that one. So, so the, the, this is um, something that Jim and I produce, um, showing the class <coughs> from Borges's definitions, and then the relations we perceive um, between that and uh, animals, basically. So, in a way, this is how you get to uh, that taxonomy. Uh, which then provides us with some fertile area for meta tags. Um, and if we move on, these, these slides are from Fania, so uh, you should probably uh, explain them yourself. So th this is the uh, traditional search engine architecture. Do you just want to talk us through this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah. So traditionally, you, you have the internet, which is your data source, what, like, where, um, you have crawlers that kind of go through all, you know, find all the different web pages that exist in a way 
and put gather the data from them into an index, um, which, which is basically a collection of, kind of keywords with pointers to where the web page they they look up. Um, and then, well, obviously, you usually have a user interface with a search box, um, and the the query word is then pulled from the index, given a certain rate, uh, ranking. Um, so that, that's the traditional view of the search engine. Okay, and then. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you then apply um, statistical algorithms um, to yeah, certain different areas of a search engine, um, you can get very different results. Um, and there's there's different. Well, in this case, we pointed out three different points where you could apply these statistical algorithms, um, which would either be to uh, augment the initial query directly before you fetch the data uh, from the index, or to um, change the way the rating is done so that um, work pages are yeah, ranked differently, um, or um, change the actual index, change the actual way we use the data. So we're calling this a patometric index, and uh, we've got this notion of pata data. So pata data is to metadata as metadata is to data. Um, so we're, we're searching, we're organising information pata physically. Uh, if, so if metadata is objective, then pata data is subjective. And we've got some examples. These are, these are quite early, early examples. Do you want to just talk us through these, Vanya? Yeah, so, so for example, the pattern data that, that is attached to a word, in this case, tree, for example, as a, as a query, if that came in, then it kind of just shows the type. Yeah, for example, the antinomy of tree could be paper, and that's then stored with this pattern data in the index, for example. Yeah. Um, so a narwhal is clearly an anomaly in the context of paper. Uh, a book is a syzygy uh, in paper terms, and a clinamen would be a Venus flytrap. Um, so you, you think, well, there's a swerve there. Sun god Ra, uh, the opposite of the sun god is a slave. Holiday is the antinomy. Uh, blue balloon is an anomaly in that context. Uh, a syzygy is a pyramid, and a sphinx is a clinamen. I think these were very early ideas. <laughs> it's next to the pyramid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a way this, this was a simple thing from these examples. The Clinman has to be has to conjure up the idea of a deviation. Clearly there isn't going to be a single answer to the to that. You know, there's not one Clinman for um, Sun God Ra. There are there are potentially hundreds of them. Um, and it is a subjective matter which you choose. Um, but that's the point of the of, of the whole engine. So um, this was a syzygy on the word fabulous. So we did a, actually did a search with it. Uh, you, you can't see the results here, but it doesn't matter in a way. The images perhaps tell you something. Um, so uh, uh, you know, using a, using um, using an adjective uh, obviously introduces another dimension because in computer in, in uh, computer science normally it's nouns, isn't it? So uh, Suddenly, this introduced a whole new area. Jim said, what words would you like to, to try? And I said, fabulous. <laughs> and uh, he Im immediately said, oh, right, that's the challenge for computer science. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a couple more, yeah. Clinamen on Mermaid. These are just to show you that we've sort of done some yeah, work. Donkey. Sorry? In that left hand one, is it a horse or a donkey? I can't see from there. Uh, yeah, it does seem to be some kind of donkey, doesn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. Okay. And some sort of bottle of hot sauce or something here. Not quite sure how you get to that. Anomalies. So the anomaly of trained boat, horse. The thing that doesn't fit, right? On the word trained. Yes. Trained to sit on the toilet. Yeah. The cat. And, and why isn't almost everything an anomaly for trained? Lemonade, couch, 
me, war. Yes. Isn't there a billion? Aren't there a billion different things at the moment? There, there are a billion things that, that seem irrelevant, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, whether they're quite anomalistic enough. Um, but it's a subjective judgment, isn't it? What, what, is, what is anomalous? I mean, you could say uh, something that doesn't fit in the general context. Yes, it could be, in theory, be anything, couldn't it? But I, but I think there are some things that don't fit better than others. Okay. How can we tell? You, you have to make that judgment. You, know. you, have to, you have to make the judgment. Okay. So I have to make my still, search engine. Does the search engine still have a connection to the original term with the anomaly? Yes. There you are. Yeah. So, I mean, there are obviously elements of training in the cat and the, the boat and the horse. Yeah. I can't see what the water thing is in there. It seems to be a, some kind of dog coming out of the water with a, something in its mouth. Oh, trained. But those are all examples uh, of training. Things that are trained, yeah. So it's not, they're not anomalies, really. Well... I mean, all those animals or people have been trained to do the thing that you see being done. Hmm. Possibly. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 that's true, yeah. But there is a connection. So you train your cat to use the toilet, would you? Oh, yeah, I mean, you, you toilet train your cat, <laughs> and literally, it's doing it. Yeah. Yes, it's but it is anomalous in that you don't expect it to be on a... Exactly, you, you wouldn't toilet, expect yeah. to train a cat to sit on a human toilet, would you? No, you would expect to train a crew to row a boat. Are they rowing in no, a it's, it's just that I think this this is interpreted probably interpreted train in the sense of a you know a, a train like a oh, right. okay. an engine. Yeah. Uh, well, these are all very yeah. early examples. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then uh, finally came up with this this rather nice thing of a green candle that can be applied. So you, if you imagine a, a typical Google search, and then you could click the um, the Syzygy surfer uh, <laughs> and uh, take you to a different result. Um, it would be nice if we could persuade Google to include that. <laughs> I doubt we will. And uh, then I also started thinking about some kind of interface. Um, so um, you, could have a, you could have a kind of record of what you found. Because, I mean, this problem of the infinite field of possibilities you know so you have a, a kind of a trail of what you've hit and you might feel that at a certain point that you've got beyond the point where this is now um, tenable as a as an example of anomaly it's now just got to be random so you want to go back to something that uh, makes makes less sense or makes more sense depending on your point of view so you, you'd be able to go back through and each of these represents a hit that you could then click on that would take you into another spiral with another set of hits in there so we've just got time for Fania quickly to demonstrate the, uh, what she's done. Uh, the, the text is just the postural. Yeah, so I mean, this, yeah. is, this is a simple prototype. So instead of searching right. the web, this, this is searching within the text of um, this, this book. Um, and it produces three different sets of results for three different algorithms that I've used. Which is, as Andrew said, the most like swerve um, for query of the word clear um, pulls out these kind of sentences that kind of because they've all got EA in them. Is that yeah, right? that's uh, well, there's. I thought earlier it, it's worth pointing out that the, the idea of the syzygy surfer is not to produce serendipitous results. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. Um, but it's. You know, so these algorithms have a clear structure behind them. There's there's a logic that explains how each of these words are pulled out of the index. Um, and this, the, so syzygy and the antinomy um, both rely on word net semantics, for example. Um, while the clinamen, which somebody already pointed out, um, actually works on um, abusing a spell correction algorithm. <laughs> so instead of correcting words, I'm, I'm actually introducing spelling mistakes. So we've got one there that says oboe, I noticed. Because of two O's, is it? Possibly. Great for poetry. I mean, uh, can, I, can I use this? Okay. Yeah, it's on the web. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, this, this, this is on, on the web, yeah. Um, and what? It, Sorry. Yeah, Andrew... Um, yeah, what, 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 what we've used it for so far is um, 
generating text for an online opera. Um, yeah. So there's, a, there's an opera project that is launching in mid-June, and uh, the t it's a series of islands, this opera. And one of the islands, um, called Amorphous, uses this uh, tool as a, as a way of generating libretto, basically. Um, so the libretto constantly uh, changes. Well, thanks, Fania. I, I mean, I, you know, that's, that's, this is as, as far as we've got so far. So this is early days. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're not presenting finished, finished research here by any means. So you get the, get the idea of what we're trying to do. And, and when um, it's rolled out to use the whole web as its database, well, it I'm not sure it ever, it ever will be rolled out to the whole web. I mean, I, I, one of the things we talked about quite early on was this business of, you know, if you, if you apply anything like this to the web, I mean, it's back to Gabriel's point, really, about the infinite field of possibilities. You, you then end up just bringing back porn, you know, or, or pop stuff or commercial stuff. So you, we, we thought, well, we'll limit the field to... Um, large online databases that where the content we know is um, going to be suitable for this kind of work, but as you can see, so far we've only we've just worked with a single book. But, I mean, you can um, do yeah, yeah. That I mean, once we've got it into a state that we feel we can really properly publicise, um, then we can see how you can uh, apply it uh, more widely. Um, yeah. Yeah. You've got all these digitised books. Yes, we have talked about that. Yeah. Andrew, can we go back to Borges' uh, list of uh, definitions you started off with? Yeah. I wanted to find out, I'm trying to work out the limits of it. Where if one continues in that direction, it would one have gone too far and no longer be pathophysics. Uh huh. Because it seems to me that All right. in that list, I don't know if Borges done it deliberately, but if you look at the one that says those included in the present classification. Yeah. Now, if he'd said, interestingly, those not included in the present classification, you'd have a delicious paradox. Because well, by being... have others. <laughs> others uh, yeah. seems to be that, doesn't it? Yeah. No, no, others, no others wouldn't call, call the paradox. Um, the ones that are not included, because the, the definition in the present classification refers to itself, if you put not in the present classification, classification then uh, anything that meets that criteria doesn't meet that criteria. Mm. Anything that's included because it's not in the present classification is therefore in the present classification. Uh, classification. Yeah. Therefore is not in the present classification. Therefore yeah, is no, it. I, I just, you you, you get a kind of infinite regress. You get an yeah. infinite regress. Yeah. 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 That would be my, it would, wouldn't that paradoxical entry be more pathophysical than all the others? Or would it be less? Is, it, is introducing paradox the kind of thing Jack, well, is actually the ratings engine, well, 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 here, here we butt up against um, uh, something that I haven't talked about at all, which is the doctrine of equivalence, okay. um, which says that uh, in a universe made up of exceptions, every exception is equally exceptional. Therefore, there is no more or less pataphysical yeah. um, element. You know. So to say something's more pataphysical is, is kind of meaningless. Mm. in that context. But it certainly would produce an infinite regress, yeah. mm -hmm. um, which I guess Borges would have liked. I'm not sure Jarry would have done so much. Jarry's idea was that um, uh, the plus and the minus exist simultaneously um, in... Uh, so s mutually exclusive opposites exist mm. simultaneously, and from that comes energy. Yeah. Um, whereas I think Borges would have preferred the, the infinite paradox idea. Yeah. Yeah. The infinite paradox goes... Bertrand Russell mad. I mean, that was the yes. Um, yes. Principia, well, it? the whole Principia is uh, yeah. founded on that, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, but I agree, it would, if you put that there, that would introduce that, that uh, infinite regress. Yeah. Now, I'm conscious of time, so I think at this point we should thank Andrew, Fania, yeah. and Hanji for uh, a mind twisting of <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for coming. Yes, there's lots more to say, I think. Actually, read the book. Cheers. Oh, please do. Yeah, please do. Cheers, Andrew. Cheers. Parallel in terms of mind mapping exercise you know when you were saying how do you explain this and start to look at the spiral going backwards mm. 
it's almost like a, a, a mind mapping relationship that goes on because there is still a relationship even though you're you're looking at combinations there is still that kind of link yeah so graphically and certainly if you're using other things other than words to actually define this is it not a kind of mind mapping um, lateral thinking exercise using a database more than one's own mind yeah, I think I think uh, I think essentially that's right. Um, uh, I mean, uh, you know, clearly once you introduce computers, the you go well beyond the human capacity uh, in terms of you know the amount of information that can be processed and dealt with. Um, but it, but it is a kind of uh, I'm I'm not quite sure what lateral thinking means, although I've I've read De Bono, but um, I'm, I'm still not not quite sure I understand it. But um, uh, it's that in that t in that ballpark, it's it's divergent thinking, I suppose you'd yes. say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'll go with divergent thinking, but obviously there are still, even though um, the categories that we use, there is still that link back to the key word. The key, the key idea. There's always some kind of sense of underlying unity. So part of the attraction and the mystery of the thing is that you, you can detect. I mean, that's immediately what people started doing. I said, oh, well, hang on a minute. Those, those trains are all examples of things that have been trained, you know. Or, uh, or is, is that just got the letters e, e, e and A in it? So that's why, you know, so people immediately start to find those, those connections. You've removed the sense of deliberacy, I suppose, in terms of the results which are generated. Yeah. And because of that, then the, the connections which you draw are made retrospectively yeah. rather than preemptively. Yes. So you don't have a sense of purpose. Yeah. You can still make the connections yeah. if one chooses to do so. Yeah. But it introduces that the creative aspect and it's sort of yeah. inactive in retrospect, if you like. But, it, yeah. Kant called it purposiveness without a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be interesting to see the reaction of people, for example, if this prototype didn't cluster the results in these categories to make it so obvious that mm -hmm. there's a mm -hmm. relation between them. If they're all mixed up, you probably wouldn't be able to tell, oh, it's actually always just a spelling error. Or, mm. Well, I, I think I think people have a natural tendency to try and figure out what the algorithm is, don't they? And then once they've figured it out, they say, "Oh, that's that," and then they want to play this. So you you then want something that's more extreme. You know, can we get something that's even more uh, loosely, apparently loose, but still connected? You know, how far can you push it? So I guess we're we're experimenting with that. But at the same time, you think, well, you don't necessarily. You know, that isn't really the point. Is is to be as extreme as possible in terms of the. The, the looseness of the connection. It's more about stimulating new ideas. I mean, the fact you could tell that all those were, had EA in them. When you read the actual sentences, the range of uh, meanings and what, what it was throwing out was quite extraordinary. The know. thing that stuck out to me is that it hasn't searched for just that word term to search for the sentence which contains yeah, it. So yeah. Yeah. So suddenly you, you, you've got a whole succession of really strong images that seem, uh, seem related and yet aren't. Um, uh, it's partly because it's all come from the same book, of course, um, but you could imagine that extending to a wider sphere. So I think figuring out how the algorithm works is not really the point. It's more to do with uh, the results that it, it throws up. It's almost yeah. like you, you, you don't... Uh, Alan's made a little picture search, um, and it depended on the tags that people had used in Flickr. And um, it's remarkable how random they are. And yeah. That's just... It's, it's addictive. You throw in yeah. words and you come up with the most bizarre combination. Yeah, yeah. And of course, those are subjective tags. Mm. In the sense, they have tagged it with something. Yeah, it means something to them. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it means something else to me, which is good. Yeah. And yeah, so you know that gives that element of surprise, doesn't it, when you search on on them, which is what we're trying to capture, really. Yeah. Yeah. That is something else. And, yeah, I got phrases like aliens want cheese and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. It's like that's what you want. You, know, yeah. you want that kind of sideways. Is that pathetic? Was I <laughs> dabbling in pathetic? Yes, you were. Um, but then I can say that without any hesitation because um, everything is pathetic. Yes. <laughs> 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 it's um, six blocks. I presume this is Lee who's worked with Lee Scott. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'd yeah. Like to ask about so I've got to run off to a meeting. In a Okay, well, well, he, he will, he will um, like Fania, uh, will tell you loads about how he's approached some of the yeah. solutions. So, I mean, each of these islands has a different way of working. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we're doing a presentation about it, actually, on March the 1st okay. um, in, uh, in the IOCT lab. Yeah. It's an all-day symposium. starts at um, 
11, I think. I think it's so interesting because everything in society now seems to be aimed to be useful, especially when you look at schools and the way they educate kids. Well, everything has to be a number and a set and a useful little bit of knowledge that's absolutely useless. Yes. And it'd be so nice if you could just even here at the university. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, it does seem to. It's a social problem as much as a, um, yeah. a scientific or educational problem. It's useful. I've got to go now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Try and look at things differently is basically the message, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they don't. Things aren't necessarily connected to their utility, and you can see things another way. Yeah. I know. It would be so so sweet to let the children experience this. <laughs> Our children. Yeah. I think, uh, funny enough, I think children do do it. Yeah. Mm. In terms of if we're looking at this as a, a method of creativity, they do make um, what appear to be to us illogical connections. Yeah. Uh, mm. And that's where the creativity comes, and then we knock it all out. Yeah, isn't that the truth? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and therefore, even now at undergraduate level, before, if you. You could get some of that, but they've been so programmed to this is the end result, this is what you need to do, yeah. Yeah. that that connectivity isn't there. Yeah. They've lost the ability to connect. This is why I use extreme things like pataphysics, which are so ridiculous, because it seems to me you have to be extreme to yeah. get that back. Yeah. You know, it's no good just coming in and saying, well, wouldn't it be nice if we were a bit more creative? You know, because people say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly that's why I'm interested in the kind of database way of doing that. And yeah. but certainly I've tried to do it with whatever you call the, the, the lateral thinking type approach. Yes. Taking uh, totally obscure things and, and designing things from two obscure, unconnected elements yeah. uh, and, and that kind of thing. But So I'm very interested in where this goes in terms of a... Search engine. Great. Yes, we do yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll keep you in touch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. See you. Bye. See you. Bye.